Uh, good afternoon. This is Guillermo Sabatier, uh, your host on Perspectives, Perspectives on Energy. Excuse me. I am the uh, Director of International Services for HSI. And uh, once again, uh, thank you for having me as your host on today's show. I will not be having any guests today. It'll be just myself. Um, it turns out I'm, I'm traveling for work. I am in a town, small town called Murfreesboro out here in Tennessee. So uh, working with the local utilities and co-ops. So pretty exciting work, but I uh, sure will not miss an opportunity to host a show in uh, State Tech Hawaii. And today, well, the topic we're covering is going to be uh, distributor energy resources, otherwise known as DERs. And I'll be using that acronym throughout the show, distributor energy resources, DERs. And uh, we'll talk about uh, their use and how we're expecting to see perhaps uh, the proliferation of peer-to-peer -peer energy marketing in, in the future. Um, maybe, maybe last year, I wrote an article that's posted on Energy Central. Uh, we'll be sharing that later on in the link, but kind of talks about all we're going to be discussing today. But uh, in a nutshell, really, it's um, how that's going to shape the, the future of distribution, how it's going to, going to shape the future of utilities. And um, as we move further ahead, you know, hopefully regulation will take will take place and hopefully keep that uh, running reliably. So what are DERs, right? Uh, usually uh, what they mean by that is distributed energy resources. That could be anything from a simple standby generator or somebody's house that runs on gasoline or runs on natural gas. Uh, it could be solar panels. It could be the micro hydro. I mean, if you live in a slightly uh, elevated location that you have a source of water and you can collect it and there's enough volume and flow that you can probably run yourself some micro hydroelectric energy. And uh, in a lot of cases, that's usually enough to run your house. And uh, the idea of a generator, of course, usually in Florida, I see that quite a bit. That generally happens to be um, there for emergencies. But in a lot of cases, uh, they're usually too expensive to run compared to the utility prices, right? So uh, in Florida, there are 11 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour. I know Hawaii is like in the high 20s, low 30s. Uh, and so they're pretty expensive energy compared to the rest of the, the, the world, right? Um, so. For the most part, um, the incentive for most people to put on these uh, these DERs really has to do with the fact that they want to offset the cost they're having on utility energy. So usually they do this with uh, solar panels or rooftop solar, right? Uh, and that's usually not to be confused with the utility scale solar that the utilities um, themselves install in larger facilities, right? They, these, these are like you know, uh, dozens of dozens of acres. Uh, this rooftop solar really is at residential level and usually produces anywhere between 10 to 20, 30 kilowatts, right? Uh, that's the capacity in some cases, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on size. You also see them on some commercial sites, industrial sites, and usually they throw that up on a, on those uh, on those uh, roofs. So as you can imagine, that ends up being um, a lot more capacity and they end up with... Um, a lot more space, right? So, um, so how does this impact the utilities, right? So, normally these uh, DERs, in some cases, they end up being shown as a reduction of load. So, for example, if a, if a consumer, uh, a residential rate payer, is consuming about say a thousand kilowatt hours, well, if you have a five hundred, a a five hundred or similar capacity rooftop solar system, then you will be offsetting that by that much. Of course, remember, you're only doing this during certain hours of the day. The rest of the day, you still need to be connected to the grid and you will still be connect, uh, consuming energy for those other, was it 20 to 18 hours, right? When the sun doesn't shine. But for the most part, right, you are generating electricity and if the system's big enough and you're not running a lot of uh, appliances that consume a lot of energy, you will be uh, perhaps producing energy in excess of your consumption, right? Now, some utilities, of course, have net metering. Others have uh, uh, some, some kind of other arrangements where they'll, they'll, they'll buy your power. Others bank your power in, 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 your, in your account where it's like, and that becomes useful. The, one, the ones I'm familiar with in my, in my state, they usually bank it, and you, know, you in the winter you generate a lot of electricity. You bank that, and then when when, the, when you come into the summer months, then you know, all that extra banked uh, 
credits, you know, usually come into effect and they benefit you. Other utilities and other regions that what they do is they they pay for that energy at a wholesale price, which is never never quite the same price you get, you know, for for generating it, of course, right? So, uh, different economic incentives here. So. That's great if you're producing it, but unless you store it, you really can't make the best of it, right? So naturally, what's going to happen next, right? They are going to, you're seeing a lot of other sources, a lot of, like, for example, Tesla, the Tesla Powerwall is one example where you're, you're storing some of that excess energy. Right? Uh, what also, what else are we also using? Given the new, uh, they're bringing back the EV tax credit. So you, you're going to see a lot more EVs entering the market and, uh, it only be a matter of time before some of these EVs are used and dispatched by the utilities. So, already a pilot program happening right now at um, Pacific Gas and Electric. So part of that is is these microgrids and and DERs and how they will impact the system. Right. So what's happening there is uh, they have they're going to be using that as a virtual power plant, uh, and. And they're being aggregated by an aggregator. So what's an aggregator? Well, as, as authored by FERC Order 2222, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, they authorized uh, third, third parties to aggregate uh, all of these uh, energy sources into one virtual power plant that they will inject somewhere into the system, right? Normally, they'll be doing this at the distribution uh, operating bus since most of these plant, most of these DERs are are being sourced at the customer rooftop solar and along their energy storage, whether it'll be batteries or it'll be an EV used in conjunction with the actual solar uh, rooftop solar source. So ultimately, these will no longer be consumers, they'll also be producers of power and uh, which are known as prosumers. So in this regard, right, it's only a matter of time before they are able to buy and sell power from their neighbors, either they sell power to the neighbors sell power to the system or sell power out to a third party application, which that's already headed this way. And um, it'll be interesting to see how that impacts reliability, how that impacts uh, support and how that impacts uh, cybersecurity. So these different aspects are discussing them. Now, when it comes to the utilities, right, uh, the ones that get ahead of this and actually uh, stay in control of this whole process uh, by either by incentives, whether it's uh, incentivizing it through laws and mandates, or incentivizing it through per patient, meaning that they, they control the economic benefit of them. Uh, they stand a better chance of actually uh, uh, implementing these systems and leveraging them, to, leveraging them to the advantage of the utility, while at the same time rewarding uh, customers that actually operate them reliably. What's a good example of this? Well, um, a power plant, say, a a utility needs three, four hundred megawatts, and usually they they installing a salt site is not feasible. It can't be dispatchable as easily, and a lot of those usually uh, need to operate during the peak anyway. Uh, putting together a conventional power plant that usually converts convert natural gas um, and is dispatchable usually not feasible unless it's you know it's it was it's normally what they go as a solution. However, in some places it's becoming increasingly difficult to site this, get it permitted, get it installed, and it takes years to deploy. The benefit for utility at this point is to, when they incentivize this as a resource, they also uh, allow themselves the ability to be able to dispatch this as a generation resource. So instead of buying, building one facility that can generate three, 400 mats, they will use uh, their customer base who is already producing electricity and storing it and sending it back to the grid, they'll give them an incentive to go ahead and sell their, their power to the grid rather than using or storing it. Um, in this regard, the customer wins, the utility wins by applying it a way of cost. And at the same time, they, uh, they come out ahead by not having to uh, go through all of these uh, in, environmental uh, legal and regulatory loop, uh, hoops that they would normally otherwise have had to have gone through by upgrading lines, building power plants, building a fuel line for this. And um, so it benefits everyone. Now, when a customer is not really um, selling power to the grid or consuming it, uh, they would normally be storing it right in this regard. And now, mind you, they're, they're using all this during the day when there isn't any, I mean, there, there's enough sunlight there. 
uh, in an environment where there's not a lot of um, air conditioning requirements and it's a lot cooler than they, they can probably pull this off, but in a hotter day, they, it will be mostly unlikely. But let's say they can, well, now they have the, and they build a large enough array to, to collect all that solar energy, or they have a pretty adequate um, storage capacity with batteries. Now, or say, for example, they're using their electric vehicle that's storing energy at home that can be dispatched and now they can decide to once their car is fully charged they can go ahead and you know sell power to one of their neighbors well right now there's about 14 different uh party companies that are and organizations that are working and competing towards coming up with a common protocol to be able to manage this so far there's a few there's one company that definitely dominates the the wholesale energy markets uh, by putting the software that manages all that at the utility scale level uh, and they dominate across the nation and internationally. And they are the most ones most likely to probably get ahead on this. Um, they, are, they are finally getting into the hardware market by actually building smart meters. So, and, and the, along with the smart meters, all the equipment and infrastructure that will manage and govern all of these devices for these prosumers. So what does this all mean? You know, ultimately, you'll see, you'll see the possibility of using something as simple as an app to be able to, or, or that kind of mobile platform that will connect with your devices. And they will, of course, be able to buy and sell energy from their neighbors, even on the same secondary bus, which means these are your next door neighbors. So it, it, can, it can get that granular where you'll be able to buy and sell power to these neighbors. So a customer has a large system that is pretty efficient compared to other competitors, well, you'll be able to sell that to different neighbors. And then these neighbors will probably buy power from others. So it'll be interesting to see how that happens. So um, there's a couple of concerns with that, um, namely it's the reliability aspect. Uh, a lot of these distribution circuits were only designed to have power flow in one direction. So when you're introducing uh, power flow or current flow going the opposite direction, that's gonna, it's going to affect a lot of the dynamics, right? Uh, and a lot of the protection systems are in, that are in place. So that may need to have a, a little bit of change when it comes to uh, understanding where, where they're at. Uh, the other issue too is is being able to um, resist a cyber attack. If this is a platform that becomes one or two platforms become the dominating provider for this particular service, you know, uh, if it's one or two platforms, one of those becomes a compromise and a cyber attack, then you can imagine the type of damage they could do, not just to customers' identities, but really the the grid. They could easily pretty much disable or black out the grid. So that, that could be a considerable challenge when it comes to maintaining security in that regard when it comes to so against a cyber attack. Yeah, so that is um, something else that I mean keeps me up at night anyway. Uh, and of course, the final challenge really uh, comes from the point of regulations, right? So when you think about how that is regulated, uh, right now the FERC, which is Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and then NERC, the North American Electrical Liability Corporation, they generally uh, apply uh, standards and regulation on the utility industry, right? Uh, whether it's generators, uh, vertically integrated utilities, transmission operators, even the distribution, well, to, to a certain degree, uh, an aspect of those serving entities, which are distributions, right? But this is going to impact the distribution side. So it's a side that NERC really doesn't, govern very much and it's gonna it's gonna have to require a lot more oversight from FERC and from the Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. So this could be a little bit of a new a new field of a, and I think we're lagging behind a little bit when it comes to the aspect of whether the technology is currently at, where it's going, the speed at which it's developing and uh, it's it's racing ahead and the utilities are trying to keep up with it. And trying to get ahead of it, so they stay in control of what's happening and not 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 lose a handle on the reliability, because it's it's not really a competitive issue with them, because they they always have the economies of scale to to really uh, beat back anything that the customers could throw up on the roof and 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 be efficient and cost effective. In some places, uh, customers that that live in areas that the rates are really low, uh, they they are never going to see a return on that investment. Uh, they may get some solar, but really they finance the system costing them tens of thousands of dollars the likelihood of them actually getting that, that money back in their investment based on what they'll save on their bill it's going to be more than several decades so the likelihood of them enjoying that be, before those solar panels degrade 
to the point of them that they're no longer efficient, it's just not going to happen. However, in other parts like in California, Hawaii, uh, even even Alaska, right, uh, the cost of energy there are, is much higher. So the incentive and the payoff it's it's a lot more tangible. Right? So um, with regulation, I think uh, it's going to come with quite a bit of change. I think uh, once one of those major companies wins the protocol, I mean, and that, that is what it's called to use for communication amongst all these devices. Uh, the next step will be, of course, um, regulation for the sake of cyber of, of, of reliability, and then also regulation for the sake of cybersecurity. Uh, there's a lot of strict security standards already in place for the utilities. Those are called the SIP standards, which is critical infrastructure protection, and uh, those standards are quite severe. Uh, a violation of one of those, uh, a severe violation of one of those NERC standards is usually can be upwards of $1 million per infraction per day. So that can add up pretty quickly. But um, given given that the uh, distribution is going to be a much larger widespread area, it's going to be interesting how that is applied. Um, in my opinion, though, it's, it's, and, and I'm, I'm just one man with one opinion, I think it's going to be interesting to see how markets will play out against uh against regulation especially in these like decentralized uh markets and then decentralized control really so ultimately it'll have to be a lot of automation taking place with a lot of these distributed energy resources right der's um so uh, the other interesting factor or aspect of this is as things become more and more affordable you're going to see a whole lot more uh solar panels thrown up on roofs uh, the inverters that go along with them, the equipment to control them, their uh, the way they tie to the utility service, so meaning that they're going to be synchronized. So these inverters are going to be a lot smarter, and then there's going to be protection. For example, during the event of an outage, it won't allow these uh, these resources to be tied to the grid in in order to protect the utility and utility personnel, right? Especially when they're operating or working on restoration. Uh, the other challenge, of course, is that well, any of these devices have they are going to create a, uh, the output of any of the solar panels and batteries, of course, is DC, direct current. These uh, inverter devices, of course, have to uh, convert all that to, to AC, we create a nice clean signal at 60 hertz if it's the US, and then, of course, synchronize and tie to the utility. Okay. Uh, one of the requirements they have uh, already at utility scale is to be able to ride through a, a fault or ride through a disturbance. So at the utility scale, they already have those requirements but they don't have quite the same requirements yet i mean for distribution usually distribution if it, there's a fault they, the, the lines basically uh, be de-energized and and and, and re-energized as the fault clears and in some cases it isn't de-energized for a long time because there's either line damage or just, there's some kind of vegetation on the line or somebody uh, drove into a pole uh, that's usually what you see in distribution circuits so a lot of that is uh, things to be considered, right? So not as complicated or as critical as a, as a transmission level uh, circuit, but as you have enough of these systems out there in place, they will play a significant role if there is an aggregate response to a disturbance, right? Um, so as we march forward, right, one of the things that I think will be interesting is, of course, us as the public and as the consumers and also utility customers, right? It is to get a lot better uh, acquainted and better educated with these systems. So a perfect example of what's happening, uh, at least in Florida, one of the very large Florida utilities are, they're providing an, an incentive plan for the installation of EV chargers. And I talk about level two EV chargers, which is kind of like the, the Tesla charger. It's like a, can, can provide about 32 amps and charge your car in about a couple of hours. Uh, normally, the installation of this device, the device itself, runs about twelve hundred dollars for a Tesla unit, uh, maybe three, four, three to six hundred dollars for a, for a different brand like EV or Evolution. So, um, and then of course the permitting and the labor is another grand or a couple of grand or so. So basically, you're looking at spending anywhere between three to four thousand dollars on uh, total cost for the installation of an EV charger in your house. So this utility in Florida is giving you an incentive to um, install one of these chargers and they handle the, the actual hardware, they handle the, the labor and installation, they handle the permitting, and then they also give you unlimited off-peak charging 
for your EV. And all of this is done at a mere $36 a month, which really is, is a bargain. And all it requires is a 10-year commitment. So if you're going to live in your house for 10 years, um, even if you sell the house, uh, the next buyer is, is going to inherit anyway. So if you buy, if you live there for 10 years, I mean, buy, uh, charging your car off peak for $36 a month is, uh, is maybe one-third to one-fourth the cost of being able to charge your Tesla at the same time, by the way, uh, off peak, which is kind of, you know, we pay it like a hundred dollars a month in charging our Tesla. So it's, it's, it's way better. And, you know, and uh, that will be really attractive for somebody who is just getting into the EV market and they, they don't want to do the extra, the extra spends of installing a charger. So not only that, you know, when you think about it, that actually will improve the value of a home. Uh, the other thing that I think they're doing, of course, in this case, is is they are they are they are controlling the rate and the time at which these are uh, these EVs are can charge. So they can control how they can charge off peak. The utility then, of course, can can offset the problem they're having with with valleys, which means uh, too much power, not enough load. Some utilities are beginning to see this valley ha happen twice in a twenty four hour period. Like sometimes, normally, it happens at night between the hours of two and to one and five in the morning. But now you're seeing it happen in the middle of the day, uh, just when you have a lot of solar and everybody's at work and everybody's settled in. So that's one way for the utility to control what it is they're doing in this regard. The other aspect I see is like they're going to have the ability to then dispatch these stored energy resources, right? They'll be able to use them in as additional megawatts for any contingencies or any events. They might be able to pay customers for a dispatch uh, availability, they'll pay them for the actual uh, megawatts. Or in a customer's perspective, there'll be kilowatts a day that they supply to the system. So again, uh, this is another opportunity to have these devices generate income for the customers while at the same time, helping the utilities uh, avoid cost and then also uh, count on it as a resource. And, and the final, I think, most important aspect is the fact that these uh, DERs are spread out throughout the system, meaning that they can be deployed and activated at times where they have a certain need for voltage or, or, or energy in certain specific parts on, on their system. And that, that becomes really, really critical when it comes to uh, problems with frequency or, more importantly, problems with voltage decaying. And, of course, they can also push back on an area where uh, some some... Some customers are consuming a lot of energy, so then, of course, they can use the other DERs or prosumers to supply part of that load. So a lot of exciting things to happen, I think. Um, not to mention the fact that that same utility and other group, groups of utilities in the state, I think their goal at some point in partnership with Evolution Chargers is to basically have the equivalent of a supercharger at nearly every gas station in Florida. So that is going to be significant, and that, that will be over the next five years. So if that doesn't speed up adoption of EVs, I, I don't know what will, right? And theoretically, right, if you have EVs at every gas station, you technically wouldn't even need to have a charger in your house, especially if it's a supercharger, right? Um, of course, we all know what that does to our batteries on an EV, so you're better off charging an EV at your house. At the same time, you know, and why not? Because you have the opportunity to be able to do this while the utility subsidizes, you know, the 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 actual installation, the equipment cost, and even the charging for it. Now, the next question is, how are they going to supply? How is the infrastructure going to be able to support all of these new, uh, you know, well, what resources are they going to support all, all of these new EVs and this charging infrastructure? Well, part of that answer to that question, they say, is um, the DOE recently released uh uh, news of their approval of the first uh, small modular, modular reactors. So these will be going to be SMRs, they call them. So these SMRs, the expectation is that within the next three to five years, you're going to see thousands of those deployed throughout the country. It's very, very difficult to install one large nuclear site, but it is going to be very, very easy, economical, and difficult to actually oppose um, thousands of smaller nuclear sites. And these are basically 30 to 50 megawatts uh, that uh, that they can place in different parts of a town, a city, or a location, remote location. And uh, it can last several decades producing energy. So SMR seems to be another aspect that we're going to be seeing um, because apparently the viability of utility scale renewables uh, has proven to be a little bit unreliable when it comes to uh, system reliability. 
Uh, their output is not always steady. Uh, the utility scale storage has not panned out as well as we thought it was. We have a few a few promising technologies, and but for the most part, it is just not quite as practical. So one of the views is that um, system-wide that adoption of EVs along with the chargers and the solar panels is going to be the likely the uh, the answer or rather the direction we're going to be headed as an industry so well thank you so much for today's show um I know we just got, got have about a minute left but I don't see any questions yet and of course uh this will be aired tomorrow so I'm sorry this will be aired uh I believe on Friday. So hopefully, um, if you have any questions, just feel free to write them down in the comments and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. But then again, I always enjoy responding. Um, I still have to catch up on a lot of these comments. But once again, thank you so much for um, watching. Remember, click like and subscribe. And thank you for watching Think Tech Hawaii Perspectives on Energy. This is Guillermo Sabatier, Director of International Services for HSI, the Health and Safety Institute. Um, signing off. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.